It seems like society tells us that after we look a certain way, marry a certain person, make enough money, get enough degrees, etc., we'll find lasting meaning and happiness in life. But why does it seem like no matter what we accomplish, no matter how hard we work, we always end up feeling like how we started? Always chasing the next thing or the next experience of happiness and meaning in life. Researchers believe this has to do with a phenomenon called hedonic adaptation, the tendency for humans to quickly return to a relatively stable level of happiness despite major recent positive or negative events in life. This is the reason why it appears lottery winners and paraplegics return to the same levels of happiness after the significantly good or bad event. If hedonic adaptation exists, and our sense of well-being in life won't change much no matter what happens to us, including winning the lottery even, how should we approach life then for the most happiness and meaning? Should you even bother to slave away at your job trying to pay bills if the happiest you'll feel on average is, well, like you feel right now, no matter what happens? This video will explain what hedonic adaptation is, go over some of the current research behind it, including taking a look at how much we can influence hedonic adaptation, and what happiness researchers and psychologists recommend we can do to thwart hedonic adaptation the best we can, if it's even possible. First, before discussing hedonic adaptation, it helps to clarify what we mean by happiness. Defining happiness is controversial because it can refer to many different types of feelings, some which conflict, including joy, excitement, gratitude, pride, optimism, contentment, meaning, and others. Because happiness can mean a broad range of ideas, researchers and psychologists use the term subjective well-being in place of happiness. Subjective well-being simply means a subjective measurement of one's personal feelings about life in the present and satisfaction about one's life over a period of time. Subjective well-being is the sense of how happy you've been and how meaningful and worthwhile your life has been over a certain duration of time. It appears for each of us, even the smartest and wealthiest of people, the feelings of happiness and meaning shortly fade after we experience them. Researchers wondered if there is a baseline level of happiness or subjective well-being we're all stuck at, no matter what we do and accomplish in life. Two psychologists, Brickman and Campbell, began seriously exploring this issue in a 1971 paper titled Hedonic Relativism and Planning the Good Society. They referred to this idea as hedonic adaptation, which is also sometimes referred to as hedonic treadmill or set-point theory of happiness today. They believe that our level of subjective well-being is determined primarily by heredity, and by personal traits ingrained in us early in life. As a result, it remains relatively constant throughout our lives no matter what good or bad things happen to us. At first, it was thought that our baseline level of happiness is neutral and fixed no matter what. This was concluded in a paper investigating why paraplegics and lottery winners both had the same levels of happiness. However, more research has been emerging throughout the years that is helping to clarify what exactly hedonic adaptation is and how it works. Specifically, research has found set points are based on individuals, meaning some people have higher happiness set points than others. Some people may be naturally happier than others on average, and some may be depressed as a set point. This was concluded in a 2006 study titled Beyond the Hedonic Treadmill Revising the Adaptation Theory of Well-Being. There are possibly multiple set points as there are different factors in determining well-being and happiness since it appears that multiple things can influence happiness. It appears set points are not entirely genetic and actions in present-day environmental factors can influence baseline happiness. A 1996 paper that followed a thousand sets of twins for 10 years found that 50% of happiness is determined by genetics only, while 10% is current environmental factors. Set points can be changed, although not dramatically, as indicated by a 2005 study of 3,608 German residents. Okay, so what does this mean for you and your life? Well, I think it means to live a better life, we need to radically adjust our thinking around how we experience and obtain happiness and meaning. What you're probably being told will make your life the happiest and most fulfilling it can be probably isn't correct. The initial answer to overcoming hedonic adaptation seems to be just to give up striving for happiness and live moment to moment in the present. Just quit your job and anything you don't want to do and just experience the journey that is life doing whatever it is you want to do in the moment. However, I don't need to delve into studies about why living verbatim this way is probably a bad idea for most people. Living with no sense of meaning or purpose greater than yourself 
lends itself to a hedonistic lifestyle where one is only searching for the next pleasure-producing activity. This, of course, leads to severe addictions, loss of job and home, loss of friends and family, all of which can severely damage one's subjective well-being set point for the worst. However, thinking that something or someone will bring lasting happiness and contentment or significantly improve your sense of well-being once achieved seems to be wishful thinking too, as we've already seen. So hedonic adaptation researchers have proposed the Hedonic Adaptation Prevention HAP model to help thwart the effects of hedonic adaptation. Simply speaking, it focuses on three aspects, variety, appreciation, and aspiration. In the paper, Variety is the Spice of Happiness, the Hedonic Adaptation Prevention HAP model, researchers suggest the following. First, there's the concept of variety for thwarting hedonic adaptation. Because our pleasure response weakens the more we engage in a specific activity we enjoy, we should use the concept of variety to create more overall feelings of pleasure and happiness. We can, number one, invest in many different experiences that can bring feelings of happiness. Try to incorporate more hobbies, comedy, time with friends, and other different types of experiences that can bring you happiness each week that are different. Number two, experience the same pleasurable event in a variety of ways. This can include changing your routine or the way you do your pleasurable event. If you're a weightlifter, change up the lifts you do regularly. If you're practicing volunteering and kindness, do different types of kind acts throughout the week, like saying kind things one day, holding the door open another day, and uh, volunteering somewhere another day. Also, try doing the activity with friends if you normally do it alone. Number three, try opening yourself up to deriving different variations of positive emotions from the same experience. Now remember, happiness comes in many different forms. Can you feel a combination of satisfaction, relief, excitement, pride, and more from just one event? Next, there's the notion of appreciation. Appreciation, in a way, is the opposite of adaptation and can be used in different ways to boost subjective well-being as well. You've probably already heard of one practice, gratitude. This is the idea that happiness doesn't come from a result of getting or experiencing something, but appreciating what we already have in life. Reflect on the things in life that did bring you happiness and meaning already in a simple gratitude practice at least once a week. To get more out of your gratitude reflections, you can practice something called negative visualization. This is when you visualize a scenario from the past that brought you happiness only with the absence of the positive feeling you got from it. This may help facilitate more appreciation of the event. Also, you can try something researchers call savoring or immersing yourself in the pleasurable event you're experiencing right now. The easiest example of this is eating slower and savoring a delicious meal. Too many times we rush through the pleasurable events in our life and don't experience them or take them in. Finally, the third part of the HAP model is aspirations, specifically managing your aspirations. Some researchers theorize the lower your aspirations are, the more goals you end up achieving, which again will increase your overall feelings of happiness. For instance, which practice do you think will end up in more total happiness in your life, rewarding yourself for winning a game on your sports team, or keeping your eye on the prize and not rewarding yourself until your team wins the championship? Practice celebrating smaller wins and focusing on a harder, bigger goal. However, unlike the notions of variety and appreciation, controlling levels of aspiration is more disputed as part of the HAP framework. How much can someone improve their life by following the HAP model? Well, there are very few studies into this as it's relatively new, so no one's entirely sure. One paper noted that students who tried it reported higher subjective well-being, so it appears to work to some degree. However, this is almost certainly not some sort of magic pill for lasting peace and happiness. Even if one perfectly followed the HAP model, 60% of happiness appears to be fully out of one's control not factoring in arguments about free will and how much control we really have over our thoughts. So what's the best answer for having the most subjective well-being and living the happiest, best life we can? Well, here are two possible answers. One is to enjoy the climb as much as possible. Life has unavoidable struggles and hardships, even if we perfectly implement the HAP model or some even better version of it in the future. The best we can do is to enjoy the journey getting as much happiness and meaning from, as the philosopher Camus put it, rolling boulders up the hill by obtaining things we subjectively want in life, plus things that are objectively good for us, even if we don't want them, we can work to improve our quality of life and happiness set point the best we can. Number two is to physically rewire our brain so that all our happiness set point levels are significantly higher, whether it's through surgery or medication. And of course, no one really knows how to do this, and doing it would be far more difficult than it sounds 
But theoretically, such a thing could be possible in the future if we all want it to be. We are already altering states of happiness with medications today, after all. Imagine if these became thousands of times more sophisticated. Perhaps instead of putting billions of dollars toward space exploration or weapons, maybe it could be redirected to improving happiness set point levels. Anyway, that was a brief introduction to hedonic adaptation and some thoughts on happiness and meaning. So let me know what you think about hedonic adaptation and the HAP model and uh, your thoughts on meaning and well-being in life as well. Also, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more like it using the link in the description and turn on the notification bell to receive updates when the new videos come out. And let me know any questions you have or uh, topics you want covered in videos. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again.